whole world is concentrating upon the bombing of Gaza. I won't say October the 7th has been forgotten, but it's been eclipsed very greatly in the public mind. And, and so this enormous opportunity of, of, to educate people in what this is really about has been lost. I'm delighted today to be joined again by Peter Hitchens. He always challenges our thinking and he does it from a deep well of knowledge and a really clear capacity for thinking through what is logical and what isn't. He's written many books. The latest is A Revolution Betrayed, How Egalitarians Wrecked the British Education System. And it's a great pleasure, Peter, to have you again with us. Good to see you again. Can I begin by saying that you've recently said in relation to what's unfolding in Israel that the proposed and much hyped two-state solution looks absurd. Can you elaborate? Well, in several ways. But the immediate way is this. If, uh, what a two-state solution means is that Israel completely cedes sovereignty over the, uh, the area uh, actually of the West Bank and a large part of Jerusalem and that would become a sovereign state next to Israel. Now just imagine if that sovereign state, having been established, elected a Hamas government. And there was nothing between Israel, indeed the very heart of Israel and its capital, except a fence or maybe a wall. And what we have seen on October the 7th would, I think, make that completely unsustainable as a, as a long-term arrangement. And my second reason, I've never accepted a two-state solution as being likely or possible. I don't think that there is, first of all, I don't think there's any will among the Arab leadership in the region to have a permanent settlement. I think there is a strong, deep, not necessarily publicly stated belief that Israel should not continue to exist and such a state wouldn't have its own existence as its own end. Uh, and I also think that if you really want any kind of semblance of peace in the region, it has to be informal. If you attempt to have a detailed diplomatic solution, you'll never get there. Uh, the, the Israelis will never be prepared to concede enough, and the Arab side will never be prepared to put their name to such a thing. And also, there was the, a very interesting point made by Yasser Arafat when he was still among us. He said, I don't want to be mayor of Jericho. As leader of the great world Palestinian movement, he was an international figure. As leader of a small, poor country, in the Middle East without very much in the way of resources or armed forces, he would be a very minor figure. And you can see why that wouldn't appeal. I don't think it's workable, but I, on the other hand, I think there's a great deal of willingness to live and work together among the people of the region, which is often demonstrated when they give them a chance to do so. But I would steer miles away from trying to formalize it. And I'm always haunted by a conversation I had with an, an Arab-Israeli colleague from that very interesting group of people, the Arab-Israelis, who are among the most thoughtful in the world for obvious reasons, was who and where they are. And we were driving up uh, through the north end of Israeli Jerusalem trying to get into Ramallah in the Palestinian Authority area, which has now become quite a maze, and he knew the way. But as we wound around all these side roads and, and dodged roadblocks, he said, oh, for the good old days before we had peace. In the years before attempts were made to make a formal peace between Israel and, the, and, and the, the, the inhabitants of the West Bank and Gaza, there was actually much more contact between the two sides. Many, many Arabs went and worked in Israel, brought back good wages, uh, stimulated the economy. Personal relations between the two were much greater. Travel between the two was much greater. Almost unbelievably, uh, there was a time when people from southern Israel used to go to Gaza for the nightlife. And in, in fact, the efforts to secure a formal peace have made all that much, much worse. So I steer away from them. I think if there is hope, then it will come in an informal agreement to live side by side. What's given Hamas then the leverage to, if you like, so turn, it seems, many Palestinians into supporters of Hamas rather than that willingness to cooperate because it is noteworthy that many um, Arabs work and have jobs or have had in Israel. They have had, There yeah. are Arab members of the Israeli parliament. We forget that it is the only democracy in the area. That seems to be a one-way street. So how has Hamas managed 
to take such control well, it's similar over to, the people in that area. It's similar to what's happened with Hezbollah in Lebanon. They are, they're not corrupt. They distinguish themselves from Fatah in being not corrupt, which appeals to people who've been subjected to corrupt government uh, and administration for a long time. Uh, and they, they, they run uh, welfare services along with our activities. They're very clever politicians. And that's how they've gained the support they have done. And when the Israelis simply pulled out of Gaza and said, we're not going to try to occupy this anymore and we're just, we're just closing it off, uh, then that, I think, probably strengthened uh, Hamas's position. Now, they do also get help, although they are themselves not Shias. They get some help from Iran uh, because of the complicated politics of the region. And they've been quite successful in establishing themselves. I'm not saying that they're popular. When I went to Gaza, I've been once to Gaza for a few days, a fascinating visit. I met quite a few people who were very discontented with being ruled by Hamas, but I don't think many of them yearned to be ruled by the Palestinian Authority on the, in, in the West Bank, with whom they, of whom they had a pretty low opinion. So it's, it's politics, it's internal Arab politics, which has caused the rise of Hamas. And if you, if, if you put Hamas in power, then you put people in power who have a very militant determination to uh, continue to be hostile to Israel. And they may, uh, in some ways, uh, under pressure, say they concede Israel's right to exist and so forth, but you have to wonder whether they really mean it. So it's an interesting concept, not corrupt, but, uh, trustworthy by the Palestinian people, yeah, it's, it's, but hell-bent on the destruction of another race of people. Well, well, incorruptibility often goes with a sort of strong utopian uh, form of politics, doesn't it? It's an you're interesting... Not, you're not in it for the money, you're in it for the great goal. And these, yeah. are, these are seriously fanatical people. Well, well on that, uh, you, know, you are seeing warnings from the Prime Minister of Israel that they will destroy Hamas. There's a lot of support around the world, just as there are many who are not supporting that. Uh, they have, the Israelis have plainly have a lot of support as well to get rid of Hamas. Uh, you, you've said that you're not so sure that that's a good idea, at least practically speaking. Well, I think it's an absurdity to speak like this. It shows a complete absence of knowledge of history and facts. And first of all, are they going to go and raid Qatar, where Hamas has its, has its actual headquarters. Uh, if they can't do that, then they can't destroy it. Also, have none of them ever watched that great film, The Battle of Algiers, in which the French are depicted, I think quite accurately, by Gilles Ponticorvo in a, in a film which everybody should watch, uh, trying to suppress the, the Algerian uh, independence movement and using all the methods of, of violence and even worse, of torture, uh, all the most extreme methods which uh, powerful Western nations have tried to use against such opponents and appearing to succeed and ultimately failing completely because you might be able physically to destroy a leadership and you might be able physically to, to destroy their armed wing for a while. But if you can't destroy the forces which have brought them into being uh, and if they continue to have, as of course the Algerian FLN did, backing from outside, uh, then they will recover and they will come back to fight you again. This idea of eradication seems to me to be a fantasy which could only be entertained by someone who didn't know anything. So, so where's the position in between? Where, where, where is the option in your view? Because the pushback would be uh, that you've just answered it in a way and that in your view it won't work. There'll be others that'll take their place. But the, the position that is put is they've got to be smashed now. They've got to be obliterated. Otherwise, they will reform. You're saying well, they will what, reform what is, anyway. What is all this smashing? Uh, this, this, this talk is, is just macho uh, braggadocio. You, don't, you, you can't by physical force destroy an idea or indeed much weaken it in some cases. By physical force, you can strengthen it, as has again been shown on many occasions. My own view is that Israel's the key to Israel's survival is public opinion in the Western nations, uh, in the, the remaining democratic free countries of the world. As long as Israel has their ultimate support, then Israel will survive. I think that since actually since 1967, when Israel was transformed by by very subtle propaganda uh, from David into Goliath. 
uh, then that support has been slipping. It's interesting to reflect that in, until 1967, support for Israel in the Western countries generally came from the left wing of the political spectrum, and the right wing tended to be more sympathetic to the Arab cause. Now it's oddly and interesting the other way around. I think that needs to be, to some extent, reversed. I, I, I'm glad to see that more right wing people have come around to the idea that, that uh, a Jewish state might be an acceptable idea, but I think the left and radicals in general need to be re-persuaded. And the great mistake which Israel has made in, in, in this episode is that the horrors of October the 7th uh, were made something plain, which a lot of people have not, uh, until now, been readily able to grasp. What they made plain was that what Israel faces is not people who are acting on a grievance or who have a political case against them. What Israel was facing on October the 7th was people who hate Jews and want to kill them because they're Jews. And that's what was seen. The film is now there. The, all the body cam and CCTV stuff will tell you. And there have been exaggerations made of some of it completely unnecessarily, it seems to me. The horror of what was done by the Hamas invaders into Israel was so astonishingly hate-filled and so obviously uh, based upon racial bigotry against Jews, that it showed to anybody who has, and this particularly should be interesting to political radicals who rightly, best thing about them, who rightly hate racial bigotry in this part of the world, that this is what they face in that part of the world too, and they should be against it. But all this has now been obscured by Israel's, in my view, crazy decision uh, to respond by a bombardment of Gaza, which is both militarily useless and politically disastrous. Now, the whole world is concentrating upon the bombing of Gaza. I won't say October the 7th has been forgotten, but it's been eclipsed very greatly in the public mind. And, and so this enormous opportunity of, of, to educate people in what this is really about has been lost. Can I tease out something that you said there that seems very important to me? Um, you'll often hear people say, oh, no, no, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just anti-Israel. But in reality, they're not being honest. Well, some of them are and some of them aren't. I mean, you must have encountered uh, what, what you might call normal sort of golf club anti-Semitism, which is very common everywhere in the Western world. People who, who when they think it's an unguarded moment, will say, actually, I don't really like Jews. Uh, people who you've known for years, who, who you've thought quite pleasant and civilized. It just comes out. There are people who just don't like Jews. Uh, and, and, and quite a lot of those, I think, are among the anti-Zionists. There are people who simply have a rational... Look, there are anti-Zionist Jews. Hmm. Uh, and yes, one, of the, one of the glories of Israel is that it contains so many of them. And they, they speak so loudly and write so many good books and say so many intelligent things and are deeply critical of the country, which rightly deserves to be criticised. So you can't say that every anti-Zionist is an anti-Semite. Uh, it's simply not true. But some anti-Zionists are definitely anti-Semites, beyond all doubt, yes. And so uh, where are you then? Uh, th 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 that is something you can't do much about. If somebody is, has that feeling, it's, it's, it's very deep in a lot of cultures. And there's no point in, in trying to persuade them out of it. But you should make people more embarrassed about it. And you should also make it weaker as a political force in the West. And that's what could have happened if Israel had responded more intelligently uh, to October the 7th. The uh, aspect of the public ownership of some of this ugliness has been really striking. So in my own home country, Australia, I think many people are aghast that you actually had extremist uh, Islamists in the streets saying F the Jews and gas the Jews, an obvious resident, uh, reference to the horrors of the Holocaust. Yes, and not ashamed of it. And not ashamed of it. No, the, well, Even again, the Nazis tried to cover their tracks. They, they did. Sense of I, it's, it is astonishing. And people should learn from it. Yeah. And this is, these, this, this is, th th these sentiments exist. And one of the saddest things, I've been visiting the region, Israel and the, and the West Bank, for many years, and the last time I was in the West Bank, I spent a very interesting day in Bethlehem talking to a fascinating guy who was a former, uh, former fighter in the, in, in I think the Al-Aqsa Brigade. He'd been, he'd been fighting against Israel for most of his life. But 
after Oslo, he'd been among those pensioned off. He was now living peacefully in a very pleasant flat in Bethlehem and uh, had me round and we chatted about this and that. He was an immensely intelligent, broad-minded person until the subject of Jews came up, whereupon this sort of stream of drivel straight out of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion emerged from his mouth. And it was, it, one didn't know what to say. It was embarrassing because, again, this was, this was, this was a person who, 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 who was completely friendly, intelligent, informed, educated, uh, with much experience in life, uh, had, had brought up a young family, and there he was. And then suddenly, it was as if a switch had been turned and this poison was coming out of his mouth. It's, it's horrendously common there. And people aren't embarrassed by it. And it, it, you get it not just in, in that part of the world. I've experienced it again with, with nice uh, pro-democratic intellectuals in Cairo. Suddenly the subject of Israel comes up and again it's as if a switch has been thrown. And you, you feel this sense of despair that people who are obviously so intelligent and pleasant should hold these opinions. But they do. I must say in my own country, I don't think it'll be long before a lot of Australians say, if this is what multiculturalism has done to us, if we now have religious leaders in our country who openly proclaim, they have tears of joy flowing down their face because of what Hamas has done, that I think will be very damaging uh, to, if you like... Uh, the sort of compact we have in a lot of Western countries. Well, I imagine it will, but I, I don't know quite how you heal that, honestly. But I think one of the things you have to do is to make it clear that, that, that from our point of view, uh, this sort of language is unacceptable. I don't want to do what the Germans have had to do and ban such speech. I, in, in a way, it's, there's a very important argument for allowing it to be free so that we know that there are people among us who think this. And, and, and so we can counter them and challenge them to debate and, and, and bring them into, in, into, into public halls and universities and say, this is what you think. Tell us why you think it and let us oppose you. I'd like to see that because I think for most of them it would be a deeply embarrassing and humiliating experience because the things that they say are just simply not based upon anything other than loathing. But I, it, it, in a free society, that's how you defeat it. Uh, you, you, don't, you, you don't, and I'm very worried by the number of conservatives who are now calling on, on the, the police to arrest people for shouting stupid slogans in the street. That's not what we want here. We don't want them arrested. We want them exposed as what they are, and we want their arguments exposed as what they are. It does show up another hypocrisy, which is that uh, many of those who, uh, uh, if you like, um, in the vanguard of modern progressive politics will call for the banning of what they call hate speech or yes. language that might hurt someone's feelings that is infinitely less vicious and evil than calling for the gassing of the Jews. Uh, True. So there's a but, complete but, but, double standard there. I agree they're, with they're, you. But they're wrong be... in both cases. They, they shouldn't ban either thing. And it's, it, it's, it, once you get into the banning of the expression of opinion, then you, you damage the society in which it happens. I say, it's, you don't, the, the, the whole point of free speech is that you allow it to people who say things that disgust you. It's of no value if you don't. And therefore, at a moment like this, I have to be, because I am, a, I am pretty much a free speech absolutist within the sort of boundaries of, of, of more or less of the, the American First Amendment. Uh, obviously, you can't incite to violence. But I am pretty much a free speech absolutist. And at, at this moment, I have to say that these people should be heard so that we know, I, so it, that they can be challenged. Yeah. I, Not because I agree. I agree with them. I despise what they say, but because but that's we the have point. to hear this and we have to know that people expose. among us think this and we have to say, right, now, stand up, defend yeah. yourself mm. in a public forum against, against those who disagree with you and we'll see how you get on. Yes, I've, I think it's very hard to argue with that, but we ought to then recognise we need to extend that into other areas as sure, well. We sure, we do. But, that, that, but if, if you are to be, this is why Conservatives should watch what they say. Because you, if, they, if they say now these people should be banned, then their opponents will turn around to them in, in six months and say, but you were just a, a few months ago, you were calling for this to be banned. Why are you saying we shouldn't ban stuff that offends us? I think that's a powerful point. Now, um, can we come back to something you said that was very interesting? Israel, Israel's survival depends upon the support uh, of countries in the rest of the world. Yes. Obviously, that means America, it means Britain, it means Australia, it means, we hope, Europe. Um, but, but why are you saying that that's the key to its survival? Is it because, for example, there are American enormous naval presence now, um, you know, with all sorts no, of... No, I'm not talking about military support. There is, uh, there, that is a secondary part of it. 
The military support, which has particularly since 1973 enabled Israel to fight off uh, all direct conventional attacks, uh, was, it was, is obviously important, but military support won't come unless you have political support. If political support for Israel dies in the United States, then the, uh, the, the subsidies which Israel gets and the, the freedom to buy advanced weaponry which Israel has will disappear, and that will be important. But the, ever since the conventional defeat of, of the Arab forces in 48 and 56 and 67 and 73, uh, the, the opponents of Israel in the Middle East have recognized that they have to find another way to bring it down. And one of the ways they've chosen to use has been, as I say, the very successful propaganda campaign to cast Israel as the villain uh, in, the, in the story and also as the, as the oppressor. The, the old view before 67 was, here, look at a map, here's this tiny little country with some Jews in it, surrounded by several large, heavily populated countries, many of them extremely rich uh, and well-armed, which threaten it. And, and in 1967, I remember 67, when almost everybody in the Western world was cheering that Israel had defeated uh, the, the, the Egyptians, particularly, uh, in, in, a, in a very, very swift war. And they thought, that's over. Now Israel's established its existence and, and the thing will be over. And then again in 73, uh, it was a much closer run thing there. And I, I think that's the point at which Israel became very much the dependent of the United States, literally, in a way it hadn't quite been before. But at, at, at that point, again, the, the defeat was so total in the end that a lot of people accepted, especially after the Camp David Agreement, and the agreement of, of Egypt to recognize Israel and have diplomatic relations with it was an astonishing development, that it was now a settled fact that Israel will continue to exist. But those who didn't want that, uh, they continued to work away. And they created enormous amounts of internal strife for Israel, and they also created a very effective uh, propaganda, which has persuaded many, many people in the Western world that Israel is the undoubted villain of the peace and, uh, and, and doesn't really deserve their support. The deeper and further that goes, the more danger Israel is in in the long term. What does it, uh, what, what view would you form about what might now happen in the region? Where might this go? What calculations would Hezbollah be making? The Lebanese, presumably, have, uh, you know, experienced what it is to have their, their country and their economy smashed. They might be very wary to take on board too much risk. That's one factor. What calculations do you think might be being made in Iran? Well, I Give don't us a feel know. for what you it's, think the regional uh, uh, actions might look like. This uh, is complicated. What, what you have to remember is that the October the 7th events were not a military threat to the integrity of Israel. They were, they were very similar in this in to, to September the 11th in the United States. They were a huge blow to morale. Uh, they made the country feel ill-defended. Uh, they were savagely cruel to, to individuals. They made a lot of people imagine that they themselves might be vulnerable to such a thing. But they didn't really uh, leave Israel vulnerable to, in, to invasion and overthrow and occupation by an enemy. Hamas doesn't have that power, nor, in my view, does Hezbollah. Uh, that it wasn't about that, which, which again is why, to me, a, a, a crudely military response to it is so crass and, and, and ineffectual. But what what seems now likely to happen is that Israel will do what is, I mean, might be a triumph. I mean, I'm no military expert. I can barely fire a gun. It might be a triumph, but a lot of history again suggests otherwise. Uh, sending an army into an urban wasteland to fight a bitter and determined enemy uh, is not necessarily a good move and might go wrongly. I, if I were in Hezbollah and if I were in Tehran or if I were in any of the places where there's a good, good deal of hostility to Israel, I would simply uh, adopt Napoleon Bonaparte's great maxim, never interrupt your enemy while he's making a mistake. Let them get on with it. Uh, and get bogged down in Gaza because if once the, the Israeli army is in Gaza, it can't it can't just leave because then everyone will say it was defeated. So then it's stuck there. So you have a kind of miniature Iraq possibly going on for years, and a miniature Fallujah, if you remember uh, that awful 
mess that the West got into in Iraq after what had been supposedly an easy invasion. They might, they might roll in easily. It's incredibly easy to send troops into a place. It's a thousand times harder to get them out. So if, again, if I were hostile to Israel, I'd let them get on with it. Because I say I think they're making a mistake. It would have been disastrously more difficult uh, than it already is had Iran already developed a nuclear capability. What do you see as uh, the necessary steps to try and avoid that possibility happening in the future? Well, I'm, I'm here in an eccentric minority. I've never been entirely convinced uh, that Iran is uh, intending to become a nuclear power. Uh, it may be that it's so. Uh, I'm not in a position to say it isn't. But I think what's going on here is a much more complicated chess game, which uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has actually been playing quite cleverly. He's an underestimated man, in my view. He's both more intelligent and more subtle than his opponents give him credit for. Uh, his discovery was, and remember a, a couple of years ago, everyone was exulting over the fact that Israel was, was beginning to get diplomatic and trading relations with several Arab countries. Yes. And the, Israel is, is or has been on quite good terms with, of all countries, Saudi Arabia. Well, what this is about is about Saudi Arabia's immense hostility to Iran, and which is the, the deepest uh, division, actually, in the Middle East of all. In many cases, it, until recently, a deeper division than that between the Arab world and Israel. And that Netanyahu was playing a very clever game of, of peeling off uh, Arab states from their opposition to Israel uh, by uh, posing as the great reliable enemy of Iran. Uh, and that's what, what Hamas may have done on October the 17th is they may have torpedoed that strategy. Yes. In which case it was extremely clever, as well as extremely nasty. And again, another reason to consider very carefully what your response to it would be. In reference to your remarks about the, you know, the chessboard, you've recently spoken of the, quote, superbly cynical global anti-Israel propaganda machine. What precisely did you mean? Well, by I don't know. It's just I've noticed how every, how. Uh, Almost everyone I know seems to have seems to have bought a particular view of the area. Now, I, I have this problem. I have for many years been a a quite uh, dogged supporter of Israel. I don't. That does not mean, and I should stress this, that I'm uncritical of Israel. Israel has done, and its predecessors uh, have done dreadful things. And the, the one thinks particularly of the. The Dir Yassin massacre in 1948, in which uh, in which people who can only be described as terrorists, Jewish terrorists, killed Arab villagers, men and women, in the most disgraceful way. So the, I'm I'm not sentimental about this. I don't say that my my support for Israel uh, compels me to deny or pretend that Israel has not done, does not do uh, wicked things. Uh, but I've come to a, a conclusion which uh, this has been very interestingly described by uh, Daniel Finkelstein, Lord Finkelstein, who uh, writes in the Times and has recently published a brilliant book about his own family's uh, sufferings under both Stalin and Hitler, that what happened with Zionism uh, was that most European Jews hated the idea of a Jewish state in the Middle East. They thought it was absurd. They were deeply opposed to it, and they, they, they fought very hard against it. But after the camps were opened in 1945, with a very reluctant sigh, they accepted that actually there probably wasn't any other way of dealing with the abiding hatred of Jews in parts of the world which could arise without notice and which would always raise the question, where can they go? And that's ultimate. So having accepted that, I often found myself quite alone. People who I knew well would say to me, well, what about this? And how about the oppression of the Palestinians? And what about this brutal act here and this, uh, this massacre here and this, uh, the, the, the shelling of, of, uh, of Gaza and uh, all kinds of other things of which Israel has anatomy and Gaza? I said, well, yes, this, all these things are true. Uh, but ultimately, there are wicked, there's wickedness on the other side as well, which is undeniable. And there is an essential basic bottom here for civilized people. We have to, we have to say uh, that we have to support 
I don't talk about there is no right for any nation to exist. We have to support, in this case, the existence of the State of Israel because there is such a profound, unarguable reason for it to exist. And I think there is. And therefore, it, sometimes its friends have to say to Israel, if you want to carry on existing, you're going to have to do a better job of, of defending yourself than this, which is what, what, what I'm saying now. To step back and take a slightly longer uh, distance view of a very troubled world, one that I've heard recently described as being in a state of perma-crisis. There seem to be crises everywhere. Uh, how do you think this re problem in the Middle East relates to um, the Ukrainian-Russian battle and the fact that it's absorbing a great deal of attention, money, resources, and destabilizing the global economy at the same time as it may be very uh, op creating opportune moments for other troubling countries to embark on adventures. I don't know. I mean, here, I mean, it, it playing, it looking, trying to understand the Middle East is like playing chess. Mm. But to trying to understand the complications of this, especially when Russia is involved, is like playing chess with a Russian, uh, which is much harder than playing chess with anybody else because they're so much better at it. I don't know. There been, has been a very interesting development in the relations between uh, the Putin state and Israel, which have got quite a lot chillier over the past few weeks. And it's indeed the past few months. And whereas there had been what everybody had thought previously a rather remarkable rapprochement between Moscow and Jerusalem. So I don't know. And also the, you must remember that the, the Russian intervention in Syria uh, lies at the back of an awful lot of the events which have happened since then. Uh, Russian intervention which was startlingly successful and which greatly annoyed uh, the United States, for instance. So we have that as well. I don't know. It's too complicated for me. I don't pretend to know how these things are. What is undoubtedly true is that, of course, once you have a major conflict in the Middle East, which is and the thing about Israel is that it's and one of the reasons for its prominence in public discourse is that if you're a journalist, and indeed a television journalist with a camera crew, you can just get on a plane and go to Israel and walk into that country and uh, and go around pretty much any way you like within, obviously, military limits, film what you like, say what you like. There is a very light military censorship. There's nothing uh, remotely like the resistance to, 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 to providing information you would find, for instance, in Ukraine. And you can operate incredibly freely. And so it's, it's much more rewarding for Western media organizations to go to Israel than to practically any, any other country in the world. They send people there and they get an awful lot back. So this will concentrate world public opinion on Israel uh, and possibly take it away from Ukraine, which is bad news, it seems to me, for the Ukrainian government because they need very much if they're going to, uh, if they're going to keep this this war going, they need very much to have strong and active support in Western countries. It's also bad news for those in the, in the West who, who think that is a, 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 a conflict which should be kept going, as opposed to those like me who think it should be brought to a, to a peaceful and negotiated end as soon as possible. Some 55 years ago here in Britain, Conservative MP uh, Enoch Powell delivered one of the most controversial speeches of the 20th century, his Rivers of Blood speech against excessive immigration. Uh, he said it would lead in the end to civil strife and, and violence. And it's been, it started to re-emerge in social media. People are starting to rethink, uh, you know, have we got things right in terms of immigration policy and multicultural um, beliefs in the West. Where do you think this debate might might go? Well, I, I, first of all, I have to say, I think Powell's speech was a revolting uh, piece of work from a, a, a man of undoubted intelligence and education using terms such as pickaninnies and referring to people having excrement pushed through their letterboxes. It was a rabble-rousing speech and it was designed principally to enhance a a failing political career, and I know of people from their own families who were 
close to him as friends at the time who broke off their friendships with him because they thought it was so disgraceful. And I take that view. I also think that uh, the speech was, the character of the speech was such that it made a proper debate on the subject in this country impossible for years afterwards because anybody who raised it was automatically accused of sympathizing with Powell and of doing the same sort of thing. So I think it was, it was a disaster for any serious t- debate on immigration in this country. Also, he was wrong. I mean, Britain had, has been incredibly successful uh, in its integration of migrants until quite recently when the level of migration has become much, much higher than it was in 68. Uh, and I think that it, it, it demonstrates, I th- I've been to a lot of countries where relations between different ethnic groups are far, far worse than they are here. We do get on with each other quite well in this country most of the time and have proved him wrong in most important ways since then, in my view. I I think um, the best thing to do with Powell is to to regard him as, as I say, as a political mountebank trying to save his career with a disreputable speech. It's perhaps an illustration, is it not, of the way in which one form of extremism can trigger other forms of extremism and create a very difficult and unhelpful environment for public discourse. Sure, but I, I think... I, here's the thing. If you, there, there are some circumstances which, in which you, you're left with a position where you have to make the best of it. And for various historical reasons, a lot of British people found themselves, found that they had neighbours who came from other cultures and countries. Now, this, what we've done about this has not been perfect, and there are many criticisms open to it, but I think the effort made of neighbourliness and acceptance and a willingness to live alongside has been notable. And I, I, but I would always stress, having said that, that this, it, this becomes much, much harder if you reach very high levels of immigration, such as were, uh, as were brought about by the Blair government. And there's evidence from their own sayings from within the, the Blair machine that in doing so they actually intended to, uh, to, to make conservative opinions on the subject obsolete. So th- there are different things going on here. But what everybody involved in this debate has to do is to be absolutely determined never to say one syllable which might lead to bigotry or cruel discrimination against uh, against our fellow creatures. And that, I don't think, is a rule which Powell kept to. Amen. Um, your Home Secretary here in Britain, Suella Braverman, apparently recently developed a, uh, delivered a speech warning about a coming hurricane of migrants to Britain, uh, which she compares to the mere gust of more recent times. What was she talking about? Well, I think the problem with the current government in this country is that, like every government really since the middle 1990s, it's failed to get any kind of grip on either legal or illegal immigration. And people have realised that the, the population in this country has grown immensely during that time. And people have begun to realise that the government has no control. This particular government is on its last legs. Uh, it's, it's run out of things to say or do. One of the areas in which it thinks it might be able to recover its popularity is by talking about controlling immigration. And so the language gets more militant as the days go by. So far, despite a lot of talk, there hasn't been much effective action. And I think we have to view it simply in those, in, in those terms. It's, uh, it, it's politics with all the... I mean, <laughs> you're the last person I need to educate on the fact that politicians sometimes say things for electoral reasons. <laughs> that is certainly true. Can I ask what the current uh, outpouring of very strong expressions of views, some of them very uncomfortable might mean in countries like France with very high Islamic populations? Well, I can, I, what can I say? I mean, it, it's obviously a problem. France has not necessarily handled its, its, its migrant problem very well. Uh, in some ways, you could say they've handled it worse than, than Britain has, and the, the, there are resulting problems, but I have no solution. 
now to what or, or now or then to their to their difficulties. It is obviously a, a grave difficulty if you have this kind of thing on the streets. But how does a free country respond to it? And, and, and there we are. I mean, I, people often say that the, the American Bill of Rights and the Magna Carta and so forth are not suicide pacts. Uh, you can't just allow anything and everything. But you do also have to be very careful not to be tempted and beguiled and seduced into acts of foolish repression, which rebound on you, in a, what might be a, an overreaction to a, a, a problem of people saying disgusting things. But when they do things, if anybody does something, if people, if you, if you get episodes, for instance, of, of physical anti-Semitism, then the law has to be immensely tough about it. That's separate. It's, it's the, the free country allows you to say pretty much what you like, short of incitement. But as soon as you actually commit a crime, then, then that freedom comes to a very sharp, hard end, or should do. That's the advice I'd offer to any country in this dilemma. I find myself deeply distressed by the level of atomization, if you like, of division in, in countries that I admire and love so much, America, uh, my own country, frankly, uh, but also Britain, which has always been such a model in the past of civility and of cooperation. And when the going gets tough, finding a way through but I look at it now, you've just mentioned a government on its last legs. Uh, I look at the alternative, and the papers are talking about the Labor Party here tearing itself apart over the Israeli question, uh, raising questions about their fitness to take over. Uh, do you see, what do you see in terms of a way forward and a return to some degree of coherency and national uh, cooperation? Oh, I just spared years ago on that. I don't. I think that there's, 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 there's nothing to hope for. The, the conservatism in Britain wasted its substance on what turned out to be a completely botched attempt uh, to leave the European Union, and which I think. I mean, when I say botched, I mean, we, we've 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 sort of left it, but I, I'm I'm not by any means sure that the relationship is over, or that the reasons for doing so were fully understood, or that the people who voted for it voted for what they got. Uh, the, what, what happened for a moment during the referendum was that all the conservative-minded people in the country who'd previously been trapped in the voting corrals of the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, they all voted together in one force, and they turned out to be a majority. But they didn't, this didn't lead, as it should have done, to the collapse of the two existing political parties, which had been demonstrated not to represent the country in any way. It, it, it led to the particularly Conservative Party trying to pretend that it agreed with what had happened in the referendum when it didn't, and therefore being wildly enthusiastic about pursuing leaving the European Union, which it didn't actually want to do. So when people, people who don't want to do something then try to do it and, and enthusiastically do it, they make a mess of it, which they did. And so all the, the great forces, the pent-up forces behind the dam which was broken by the referendum, all rushed through the country and everybody thought it's the Labour Red Wall had been washed away and suddenly there was a new world. It's not happened. And what will almost certainly happen at the, the general election next year is a return to, to Labour Tory tribalism, a very strong Labour tribalism. I mean, I would, I would hope this not happen. I say to my supposedly conservative friends, I say, you zigged when you should have zagged and you, you're now going to zag when you should have zigged. They, when the Conservative Party ought to have been refused the support of any person of conscience or intelligence in 2010, when David Cameron sought uh, the, the voters' endorsement for a, for a Blairite left-wing takeover of the principal Conservative Party in the country, basically a coup d'etat, uh, when he said, I said, don't do this, the Conservative Party must lose this election, you mustn't endorse this change. And I couldn't get anybody, any other conservative person even to support me. I was on my own. Nobody paid any attention. The conservative people of Britain endorsed David Cameron's left-wing takeover of, of, of the Conservative Party and destroyed uh, the, a, a, a quite a significant force in British politics as a result. Now, uh, when we're faced with the return to power of a Blairite party, 
led by a man who's actually a Pabloite, a, a, a variety of Trotskyism so obscure that only I've heard of it, uh, is, and, and whose likely actions we can barely begin to judge. They're all saying, oh, well, uh, let's, all, let's all vote Labour to do down the Conservative Party. It's the wrong moment, as I say. They're zigging when they should have, they zigged when they should have zagged, and they're now zigging, they're, they're zagging when they should have zigged. It's, it's, it's crazy. This is the last moment to get rid of the Conservative Party. It's a useless, horrible thing. But it's only useless. The problem with the, the next Labour government is it will be actively mad. It, and it will be. I mean, people voted Labour in 1997 on, on ludicrous uh, populist manipulative slogans such as tough on crime and education, education, education. And they got uh, the, the most violent constitutional reform since Cromwell, huge redistribution of, uh, of wealth, a fanatical interventionist foreign policy, uh, a, a, and a gigantic uh, moral and social cultural revolution. Uh, which none of them thought they were, they were voting for or got. And what, what do you think is going to happen if they vote for Starmer next time around? So there's it's no... Not going to be, it's not going to be um, uh, education, 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 or um, tough on crime. It's going to be another dose of Blairite, of Blairite Gramscian revolution. There's a limit in economic terms, of course, to how much you can go on borrowing, kicking the can. Oh, there is a limit road. to that. We've, 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 and we we've, must be getting we've, very we've, close. In this country, past it, not long ago, we were actually borrowing money to pay the interest on our national debt. Well, that, and that's the end, isn't it? Well, it's intergenerational. I mean, you, might, you, might, you, you might as well take up drinking brandy in the Treasury all day. Once you've, once you've reached the point where you're borrowing money to pay interest on your debt, you've had it. Yeah. It's a very worrying scenario. It's terrible. Yeah. One last question that would intrigue me in terms of your response. Might this, at a minute to midnight, encourage people who might not otherwise have thought of standing up and seeking to lead in the way that, say, a Churchill did in the darkest hours of the late 30s? Is that a possibility? Do you see any chance of that happening? Well, the hours were dark, but nonetheless, Churchill was the, the, the prime minister of a country which still had considerable armed forces and also had the backing of, at that time, a, a large empire uh, and had many, many things on his side and also was the prime minister of a country which, which was an island surrounded by deep salt water, which must be worth at least 50 divisions in any, uh, in any major military conflict. The position was bad. Uh, but if, if you want to use it as a metaphor for our economic, political, and social and moral position now, it was nothing like as bad as the position we're in. And also the things which we've sacrificed and destroyed and undermined and, and, and failed to defend over the past 50 or 60 years would be much, much harder to recreate than or, or build up than the military strength which we lacked in 1940. So I doubt it, frankly. It sounds to me as if you're committing that terrible sin of optimism. Well, I just hope there may be people out there who see the need to step up and... Uh, yeah, but don't bank on it. Well, there's not much I can do to alter it. <laughs> no, I can only hope no. and seek to maybe encourage people to think seriously, which is what you're doing as well. The times are grim uh, and... Uh, uh, they will require, I think, uh, a level of engagement that's just not there at the moment. People are not engaged. This is the age of disengagement. Everyone just... It's the monastery of the mind for a lot of people, I think. If you can, uh, but how pervasive will the new, the new, uh, the new world be? And the, the, the huge power of the green dogma and the gigantic economic effects which that is going to increasingly have as the major nations head towards net zero, net zero targets are simply not understood by most people, which is how much of an impact that's going to have on the daily life of, of the millions. Peter, you always give us a great deal to think about, and I really appreciate it, and it's been good to see you. Thank you for having me.